Hello everyone, welcome to Go Global World. Uh, this is a global uh, digital Silicon Valley ecosystem for founders and investors where we uh, help them build great companies from the start to the later stage. And uh, as uh, one of the key thing in the Google world, we do, we share the knowledge of different things that can help entrepreneurs uh, achieving their results. And uh, today we would like to discover a startup ecosystem in Boston. Why should you go to uh, uh, Boston startup ecosystem or should not go to Boston startup ecosystem to build your company? And today with me, uh, we, I have Steve Walsh from Boston, the founder of Hands uh, on Angel. Uh, and he has a lot of expertise and experience working in Boston and he's willing to share with you his own insights. This is not something uh, we just want to share uh, basic information you can find on the internet. It, it will be his personal experience as a founder, as an investor working in that region. So you will learn from a uh, real person from that region. So Steve. Great to have you at Go Global World podcast. Uh, please tell us about yourself and happy to start talking about Boston Startup Ecosystem. Well, first of all, thank you for having me today. It's a pleasure to be here and, uh, and thanks for listening. Um, so I'm, I'm Steve Walsh. I'm the founder of a company called Hands on Angel. And I was born and raised in Boston. I've lived here pretty much my whole life. And I, I think of myself as a champion for early stage founders. I like to not only invest in their companies, I like to work with them in really a hands-on approach, which is why my company is called Hands-On Angel. I like to help them in a number of ways. Capital is one and helping them put rounds together, but I also like to help them in business development capacities, helping them get customers, helping them get partnerships, helping them get relationships as they form their company. Who is a good startup attorney? Who should I use for marketing? Who could I use for, as an accountant? Because founders, what I found, have a number of needs across a really broad area. And I just want to help them in as many ways as possible. Because if I'm giving them capital, I think I have a responsibility to make sure that that capital goes to good use and they're as successful as they could be. So uh, I started the company a few years ago. I've made over 60 angel investments into early stage founders. 35 of them have gotten to Series A, which is great. And I'm happy to report I'm about to have my fifth exit. Oh, uh, so five of my companies have gotten to an exit status, which is great, which is what we all do this for. Um, and I, you know, I'll, last thing I'll say is I, I serve at the pleasure of the founders I work with. Everything I do is for their benefit to help them build their company in their way. And I just get to play a small role. So I'm very fortunate to do what I do. And I love the way you're pu putting this, uh, uh, this message uh, uh, it's a good example to me uh, and uh, to other investors how to deal with founders because helping them is you helping uh, your own investment to be successful as well. I absolutely agree with you. Well, uh, let's get started. Uh, what uh, you are in Boston? Uh, it's twenty uh, uh, first century uh, already twenty twenty two, and uh, we know everything about Silicon Valley. It's worldwide famous not not everyone knows much about boston startup ecosystem what a boston startup ecosystem has become by now what what is it uh i think you know the way i describe the boston startup ecosystem is first of all um it's an ecosystem that is known for investing in things like biotech we have some of the biggest biotech companies in the world are headquartered here we also have some of the greatest universities in the world, uh, whether it's MIT or Harvard or Northeastern or BU or BC. We, in, a, in like a 20 mile radius, we have probably a hundred of the greatest colleges and universities, highest concentration in the world. And that gives us access to a lot, a lot of talent. Uh, and that talent goes and works for some of the best biotech companies uh, in, in the world. So that's really what we're known for. But from a startup ecosystem perspective, Boston, at least my experience has been, it's known for a great place for growth capital. If you have a company that already has an established product, established customers and established market, and sort of have that product market fit, but you need capital to grow it faster, Boston is a fantastic place to get that growth capital. There are some of the best venture capital firms in the world here that do just that. Um, the challenge, at least at the very early stage, the pre-seed and seed stage that I play at, is that I have found Boston to not be as um, malleable to those early stage founders, the, the capacity or willingness to take risk at an early stage here is a lot less than other areas of the country that I've invested in. For example, your home of Silicon Valley. 
I think has a much more progressive view of early stage and the risk tolerance. It doesn't mean that Boston founders can't find early stage investors here. I would argue it is a little bit more difficult. They require a lot more traction. They are looking for, I'll use a good example, uh, in the Boston community, um, safes, which are real popular in Silicon Valley, the, the simple agreement for future equity. There aren't a lot of safes in Boston. Uh, I think it's a mentality of convertible notes are more investor friendly and safes are more founder friendly. So you'll see a lot more convertible notes here, a lot more priced rounds here. Um, investors tend to look at things like safes as a little more risky of an investment. So you don't see them as much here. So those are the subtleties, I would say, of Boston versus the other ecosystems. It doesn't mean there aren't great investors here. It doesn't mean there isn't capital, but you have to understand what type of capital, what stage and how it's applied. I think that's the most important thing I would say about the Boston ecosystem. Yeah, and we spoke with Steve uh, before the podcast and uh, he said that like uh, there are many reasons not to go to Boston uh, and uh, we will uh, try to dig deeper on that. But my question to you, uh, if you would defend Boston uh, uh, going in there, why Boston and not Silicon Valley? Uh, I think a couple of reasons. Well, first and foremost, um, I can't believe I'm saying this because it's really expensive to live here. It's less expensive to live here than it is in Silicon Valley. So um, the, the cost of living is less. Uh, I wouldn't say significantly. The gap has closed over the years, but it is less. Um, access to universities. I mean, we talked about that concentration of universities and access to talent. Some of these universities, like MIT, for example, have fantastic uh, student-led organizations around entrepreneurship, whether it's MIT or even Babson College, have awesome centers for entrepreneurship that actually teach entrepreneurship at the student level. Yeah. I didn't know this until a few years ago. MIT actually has, I'm, I'm into crypto, MIT has the oldest Bitcoin club in the world. It was founded at MIT like 10 or 11 years ago. I actually went to the MIT Bitcoin conference a few weeks ago, and it's the oldest one in the world. So access to great thinking and great talent. Um, I'd say it's the best thing about Boston. It's also a challenge in that if you look at the startup ecosystem, because at the very early stages, it's a little harder to raise capital here. A lot of the founders go to those great universities like Harvard and MIT, they decide to be an entrepreneur, and then they move to Silicon Valley to start their company, or they move to Austin, Texas, or they move to Miami. So while there's a huge amount of talent available here, one of our challenges is a lot of that talent actually moves outside of Boston to go start their companies. It's a shame because they come from all over the world to be educated here. And then they get the degree from MIT and go, I'm moving to Austin, Texas to start my company. We want to keep that talent here so we can incubate those early stage companies here. And it totally makes sense. So this is uh, initially was the problem of Silicon Valley uh, when it was created and everybody was leaving uh, Silicon Valley after, uh, after finish graduating from university. And then they kept their first talents and founded their Hewlett Packard as far as I know the story of uh, Silicon Valley. And this is why sure. it started growing. And I hope Boston can achieve uh, those uh, results of Silicon Valley sometime in the future. But I have to, I have to defend my Boston friends in that um, we absolutely have better sports teams. It just, it just, and even though the Celtics right now are playing the Golden State Warriors, um, we, the last 20 years here, have been pretty special from a sports perspective, whether it's football, baseball, basketball, hockey. Um, I just say all we do is win. So that, that's, a, that's a trait of Boston that I love. Well, uh, I know Warriors won several times already, uh, like a couple of years ago. I'm not sure. I'm not tracking that, but <laughs> they're pretty good as well. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. Um, uh, in terms of um, trends, uh, what are the local trends uh, for the local startups and local venture uh, VC ecosystem? Uh, it's funny. The trends, especially in the last I'll call it four to five months have changed dramatically with everything that's going on in the, in the, in the larger market right now with capital markets slowing down, with the stock market going down, with crypto markets going down. What we're seeing, and I don't think this is just unique to Boston, I would say whether I'm talking to founders in Boston, Austin, Miami, or the Valley, um, we're seeing founders having to do more with less, having to go further with less capital having to control burn and runway more than they've had to worry about it in the past, having to make sure that they have good fundamentals of growth, customers, and a path to profitability. They don't have to be profitable, but they have a vision of when does break even look like? How long will this capital take to get us there? I think those themes, and I don't think they're bad. I think they're important, 
are becoming more prevalent now when people are asking for capital because investors like myself are asking a lot more of those questions. I would think, I would say that the trend over the next year, especially, I would say maybe even two years, is going to be the days of, you know, pre-product, pre-revenue companies going to YC and thinking that without a customer base or product or revenue, they can just graduate and raise one on 30. I would say those days are going to be limited going forward. I think it's going to be more business fundamentals on, can you bootstrap to get your first 200 customers and your first $10,000 in revenue and then go raise? Can you use a friends and family round effectively to do that? I think you're going to see a lot more themes around that. And that's what I'm seeing as trends, not just in Boston, but in the, in the, in the broader venture community right now. And it makes sense. Uh, uh, the markets are changing. What's, what's your take actually on uh, the uh, uh, current financial crisis uh, that is happening? And what would be the, uh, your recommendation in learning for startups? Uh, you already mentioned uh, some, uh, something. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I think people are going to have to be a lot more realistic on expectations of how much capital is out there. And just because capital is out there doesn't mean funds and venture is deploying it. I've talked to a number of venture capital firms that have fully funded funds, but yet they're not deploying for two reasons. One, if they are deploying, they're deploying capital into their current portfolio companies to make sure they survive through this crisis, or um, they're just delaying deploying capital or at lower valuations or lower amounts. So if they were writing $500,000 checks, maybe they reduce their check size to 250. I'm also seeing diligence take a lot longer because they're making less investments. They're still making investments, but the diligence process is extended and I'm seeing valuations come down, which I think they've been high for a while. So valuations are coming down, diligence process is getting extended mm -hmm. and the number of deals and the volume of, of capital is I would say it's retracting a little bit. I think mean, people are still putting capital use, but they're being a lot more specific about who they invest in and at what dollar amounts. That's what I'm seeing so far. Okay. All right, that makes sense. And th does it apply to all startups in the US or are you just talking about Boston uh, ecosystem? I've seen it across the board. I've seen it with companies I'm trying to raise right now for a company in California. I've seen it for companies in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I think it's pretty uh, universal across the board because a lot of, you know, what people don't realize, they'll say, well, a lot of these funds say they're fully funded, but those funds have LPs and those LPs are individuals like you and I. And those individuals, are in the middle of the same stock market and crypto crash that everyone else is dealing with. Right. So everybody else out there may have lost 30, 40, 50% of their, their worth over the last six months. And now here's a fund calling them for a capital call in the middle of all this saying, hey, can we do a capital call? Because we want to make five more investments. So I think funds are holding off in some cases, making those capital calls. At least the funds I've talked to have, have told me that. Mm. Okay. That's, that's a very valuable information for startups to understand right now. Yeah. Um, what, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, at early stage, Boston uh, is quite, kind of tough ecosystem for early stage companies like at pre-seed, probably seed, uh, but maybe better for later stage. Can you elaborate on this? What startups uh, should go to Boston or uh, as well as East Coast? Um, I would say, you know, from, from a Boston perspective, um, I am seeing biotech startups getting funded at the early stage because this is a biotech hub of the world. Yeah. I would say on the East Coast, if you're a fintech startup, I'm, New York is a fintech capital because it's the finance capital of the world. I'm seeing a lot of startups get funded in fintech in the Northeast corridor, specifically down to New York. Uh, crypto, same thing, crypto and blockchain. Again, crypto and blockchain tend to be very tightly correlated with fintech. So a lot of capital being deployed into that sector out of the Northeast and, and down through New York. I think those are, if you're an early stage, fintech, crypto, blockchain, biotech, I would say that Northeast corridor uh, is still uh, vibrant with capital. Um, if you're a B2B SaaS company, I still think, although you can start a B2B SaaS company anywhere now, I would say that if you look at the amount of capital being deployed into B2B SaaS, a lion's share of that capital is still in the West Coast predominantly. That is the B2B SaaS capital of the globe. Um, so if I was a B2B SaaS founder, I might be looking at the West Coast, Austin, Texas, uh, as opposed to the Northeast Corridor. But I think, you know, the COVID has sort of changed the investment thesis in that everyone is doing Zooms like this as first calls. So capital could be anywhere. But those are the themes I'm seeing relative to the different sectors. 
And this is exactly why we exist, actually, you mentioned this, because uh, I believe that uh, building a company, it doesn't matter where you are, uh, you can be in the most, uh, um, uh, uh, in a place with zero opportunities, uh, but it doesn't matter. You can start your global companies from wherever uh, you are in the world and uh, keep growing it, keep maintaining it. You can remotely get your customer, you can remotely sell. So everything in your hands, maybe it's not perfect like it would be like in 10, in 20 years from now, but it's already right. there and you already can do it. Just learn it and do those who would be the first to learn it and master it at a very, well, a very good level, they will win. And they will totally win. agreed. And they will uh, uh, educate others, future generations of entrepreneurs, how to do it remotely. Um, yeah. Well, um, uh, in terms of, um, I want to dig deeper uh, a little bit on pre-seed and seed investments. Uh, sure. Since it's a little uh, challenging uh, for them, uh, uh, what, can you name a few investment funds, uh, the most active ones that are focused on pre-seed seed uh, stage, maybe round A as well? Um, so people can uh, know from, uh, from practical perspective that these guys are the ones to go to. Yeah, I mean, there's a couple. Um, there's uh, companion ventures who I know pretty well. Uh, those guys, those folks absolutely do seed, seed stage investments. They do B2B SaaS investments, FinTech. Uh, alumni Ventures is also really big at the seed stage. Uh, there's an alum Alumni Ventures is actually one of the largest VC funds in the United States, and it's built up of a number of funds from different schools. So, for example, there's an alumni venture arms from Harvard. There's an alumni venture arms from MIT, from UPenn, from Princeton, but they all share deal flow between the alumni ventures. So in the aggregate, they're one of the largest venture funds in the world, and they do a lot at the pre-seed and seed stages. So those are two in the Boston ecosystem that I know that come to mind. Um, there's, a, there's a relatively new fund called Service Provider Capital, which um, my friend Phil Gager is, the, is a general partner there. They specifically created a fund for pre-seed investments for New England-based startups at the very early stage. So I love what they're doing. They're really trying to fill that gap of, can we be the first institutional check into a very early pre-seed stage company? So that's a great one that, that I've done a bunch of deals with. So those are three that come to mind and they're all in the Boston ecosystem. I share a deal flow with all of them and they're all fantastic uh, uh, partners. Thank you, that's actually uh, super valuable. Um, uh, thanks for sharing the names, uh, I guess it uh, might, might help some of the founders uh, that are trying to uh, raise uh, at pre-seed stage. Um, sure. Well, to me, uh, a startup ecosystem uh, consists of many different parts and one of the important part is the access to corporate, uh, uh, cor corporation sector where uh, you can get some pilots from enterprises. Uh, because uh, for B2B companies, it's, it's very hard to start selling right away with uh, MVP stage or maybe uh, some more or less developed product, but you, you might not have good credibility. Uh, you might not be, uh, it might be not so easy to go through the um, bidding process to get to those companies and uh, start selling them. So what is the um, corporate uh, ecosystem in Boston uh, to get a pilot for startups? Is it easy to get a pilot? Is it hard? Like, what is it like? What, what is it? I think I don't think it's ever easy to get pilots. I don't. I think because um, remember, it's early. You're trying to get traction. I, I don't think Boston's any different than any other place in the United States for that. Um, you know, there are organizations in Boston, like the Startup Coalition that help early stage founders network and meet each other where you can share information. So I have some good friends that run the Startup Coalition. They do really good work uh, on bringing founders together to be able to talk about, now that we have a product launch, who should we get it in front of? And maybe find some targets, some friendlies, as, as we'll call them, where they, can, where they can target that. So there are a lot of you know, early stage organizations that support the community that try to help startups, not just with a place to work and access, but more so access to talent, access to customers, potential pilots. So those are the types of organization that I would look to in Boston if I was an early stage founder. Yeah, thanks. Um, and uh, yes, uh, if we speak about the, uh, the ecosystem that the government has built or stimulated, 
Um, what are the benefits of starting uh, a startup from Boston for international or U.S. founders? Maybe there is government stimulus, preferences for international founders, maybe some visa sponsorship, maybe incorporation, um, uh, I don't know, something like uh, uh, maybe less taxes or something. Well, I would say, you know, we're not, we used to be called Taxachusetts, uh, but what I would say is uh, our tax rate is definitely more favorable than New York. I think everyone in the world is more favorable than California. So we are pro-business. Um, we're not on the likes of like Miami and Florida from a tax perspective. I mean, if, if, if I was a founder looking to found a company, um, what I always say, the interesting thing is if you're in Boston versus the Valley versus Texas, what I tell founders is if they're going to raise venture capital, in most cases, what I've seen is that most investors would like that company to have Delaware status and actually be incorporated in Delaware. Um, I would say 80 to 90% of the companies that raise venture capital have Delaware status. It is probably the most friendly state in the United States to form a company in. It's only $500 a year to have Delaware status. You don't even have to have a physical office there to do it. Uh, and so my first you know, question to a Boston founder is, even though you're going to be in Boston, we're going to file for Delaware status for the company. And then you'll still have taxes due in Massachusetts, but you want to have Delaware status. So that's one of the pieces of coaching. Outside of Delaware, I would say right now in 2022, Florida and Texas are probably the two most pro-capital, pro-business, low-tax states in the United States. I've had four of my portfolio companies in the last 12 months specifically move from California to either Austin or Miami, specifically because of tax incentives. And it's just, it just it, it, workplace taxes, it's just cheaper to run the company. And, and those, those environments are really pro-business. And uh, it's really, it's unfortunate because California has really had this edge over the entire universe over the last 20 years. But I do see that shift happening. And I mean, I only have 60, I have 60 companies and four of them in the last 12 months have, have left California for one of those two states. So what's your gut feeling? Uh, do you uh, think that uh, tell us that like those companies will uh, just uh, leave California uh, and this, uh, this trend continues uh, and... Uh, uh, as the ecosystem will grow and California will have to reshape in, some, in something else? I think, it, I think they have to. I think this is sort of a moment in time. If you look at what's happening in, in Miami with Mayor Suarez and the fact that he's increased the amount of VCs moving to Miami like 500% in a year um, and not just around crypto, just all capital. It, it's just a, it's an easier state to do business in right now. And I'm not saying California can't change that, but they're sort of their own worst enemy. Uh, if they don't change something, I would say you're going to see the innovation be done elsewhere, especially if you're a founder and you're, you're one yourself, Daniel, um, you have to go where it's easiest to run your business. It's the most economically feasible. And if you can get talent for 20, 30% less and the cost of living is 20 to 30% less, why wouldn't you consider that as a founder? It makes total sense. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, Florida to me is one of the jurisdiction where I run business as well. So like I, I, I appreciate uh, how they made, made this taxation uh, very favorable for, for, for entrepreneurs. Sure. Uh, all right. So uh, in terms of uh, um, other things uh, like grants, uh, if you have any uh, understanding and information on that, how to get a grant uh, or early uh, funding uh, in Boston? So I haven't done a lot with grants. What I have seen is there are a number of accelerators here. Um, the best one is, two of the most best known are Mass Challenge, which is a worldwide accelerator that's headquartered here in Massachusetts. Techstars is here. There's a great Techstars Boston. It's unbelievable. And a lot of those have programs where you can get some grants or get into their accelerator and they give some, uh, some cash in, in exchange for equity in your company. Um, those are probably two of the most well-known highly publicized and boots on the ground programs that I've seen early stage founders leverage, especially Mass Challenge. I'd, I'd speak the world of what they do. Yeah, uh, yeah, I heard of them as well. Like, uh, thanks for this recommendation. What are the downsides of Boston ecosystem for international and US uh, companies or US startups? Um, the weather, the uh. weather and the weather. Um, I'd say all the time, you know, Boston, nine months a year, I think from a culture, weather, food, theater, music. It's just, it's an awesome place to live. The, the university system, it's unbelievable. 
The other three months of the year, I'd rather live anywhere else because January through March, it's just hard to live here. Um, so I, I think that's the challenge is attracting and keeping talent here because the winters are tough. And a lot of people say, oh, give me a break, get over it. It's real. I mean, a lot of people just don't want to live in a place where it snows three months a year. Mm -hmm. So that's a challenge and one we have to overcome. Um, you know, remote work has helped with that and that you can find talent now anywhere in the world, as you and I talked about. I think that's helping companies in Boston compete a lot more. I would say one of the pluses of the pandemic is companies now are reevaluating their needs for talent and saying, just because we're headquartered in Boston, if we, if we want to find the best engineer and he happens to be in Miami, why can't we hire that person? Why does he have to sit physically in Boston? Why can't we leverage the best talent, exactly. set him up in a remote environment and let him do the, the job at a lower fee on, on a, from an employment standpoint? So I think that's what you're seeing. Um, the weather always used to be the reason people didn't want to move here. I think the pandemic has shifted thinking around hiring and it's allowed us to be more competitive. I honestly feel that. Yeah. Well, weather is one thing, uh, uh, definitely. Um, but... Um, I, I really like that you are uh, promoting uh, remote work. To me, it's like, uh, this is how I live. Uh, I don't see any, anything else. M all my team is absolutely uh, worldwide spread and uh, they all uh, uh, working remotely. And I think this is the future of uh, how we should work and we should learn and find the best, most comfortable way. And it's a new freedom for everyone. So I do. I do. For me, I mean, for me, Daniel, it's really opened my eyes, you know, pre-pandemic, I predominantly spent most of my time in the in the startup ecosystem on the East Coast and West Coast, specifically Boston and California. One, because I live in Boston, and two, the rest of my family lives in California. My brother and my son both live there. So I was sort of a bi-coastal investor, spent a lot of time. Well, post-pandemic now, I've done investments in Miami, Richmond, Virginia, Austin, Texas, New York. I've done investments in Berlin, Australia, Singapore. So because Zoom has become the great equalizer. I don't feel like I'm at a disadvantage anymore because I can't get on a plane and go see my founder in California. Yep. We can just jump on a quick Zoom call. Um, I will tell you, even when I look at Boston companies, the first meeting with a founder is 100% always on Zoom. I'm not gonna get in a car, go into the city, pay for parking and spend half my day for a 30 minute coffee meeting when we could just do it over Zoom and find out is there a reason for us to meet further. I think it's more efficient for the founder and it's definitely more efficient for the investor. So even when I have local meetings, I still do that first meeting on Zoom and then we can decide if we wanna spend more quality time together face-to-face. -to -face. So I found it to be a really equalizer. It makes me more productive. I went from doing you know two to three meetings a day in person to now six to eight meetings a day via Zoom in a different time zones. So you can manage your schedule a lot more efficiently. And I just think that for all of us, um, I know I'm more productive in what I do and how I do it. And you probably have seen the same thing with the distributed team. Yep. Well, I agree with that. Uh, and uh, the only thing Zoom uh, uh, gave a lot of uh, productivity, but at the same time, uh, amount of Zoom meetings uh, increased drastically. <laughs> it's another right. challenge we need to solve. Uh, but if you can manage your time, then it's a perfect uh, tool uh, to be productive. Uh, what about uh, being a foreigner in Boston? Uh, what are the benefits and key challenges uh, being being a foreigner? I, I, why I'm asking this because most of the yeah. uh, lot of entrepreneurs in the U.S. who succeeded and built great companies, they are all um, many of them are um, immigrants, and so being a sure. foreigner there, what it's like. You know, it's interesting um, because Boston has always been known as a place it, for immigrants, right? My parents. Uh, I'm half Italian, half Irish. So both sides of my family were immigrants. They came from Dublin and they came from uh, Messina, Sicily. So, um, and Boston has tr huge tradition and culture in the different um, parts of the world people are from. And it's got one of the best Italian neighborhoods in the North End in the world. Uh, it's got a great uh, uh, Asian community, a Latin community. Um, so there's a lot of different communities. And, and what I found is they're well, especially welcoming to founders. This is a place because people come from all over the world to live here, but they also come from all over the world to go to school here. So what you find is Boston is a tremendously diverse, uh, tremendously accepting place for people, for founders from foreign countries. At least that's what I found. Um, I think it's a place rich in tradition of accepting foreigners, be, uh, welcoming them because 
90% of the population came from someplace else to live here in the first place. I see. Um, and uh, if, um, if you consider the situation when um, a founder uh, considering Boston's, uh, Boston as a place uh, to, be, to go to and build their company, what would be yeah. the first steps uh, a founder should do uh, initially to soft land uh, in Boston? Here's the good news. Um, there's so much information available uh, online. I mean, that's the, the first place I would obviously yeah. start. Um, you can reach out to folks at, at Mass Challenge. There's a lot of free resources there. Uh, there's a lot of the startup incubators that have free resources, online courses, talking about Boston. What's it like to build a company here? The good news is whether it's Boston, Miami, New York, the process is very similar. You want to make sure um, you've got your corporate structure squared away, whether that's Delaware status or not your incorporation documents, 90% of it can be done online. You probably did this yourself, Daniel. I formed my own corporation, um, got all the documentation, tax information, Delaware status, everything. I never stepped foot in my lawyer's office. I did it all online, all through electronic signature. It's actually relatively easy to get started and just meet some folks in the startup ecosystem. There's just there's some tremendously talented folks here that are willing to help that want startups to succeed. The university structure is world-class and they all have startup organizations that run pitch competitions um, around town. Just start getting involved in the community, meet some people, go to some of these pitch competitions. And uh, I think you'd be pleasantly surprised at how welcoming folks are here. Yeah. Um, well, uh, two uh, questions, just basic ones. Uh, the first one is about taxation, like for uh, corporate taxes and uh, uh, individual taxes, uh, if you can just share the numbers, uh, like percentages, uh, maybe if you know. Uh, uh, so. Corporate tax rate, I don't have it off the top of my head. Individual taxes, I'd say we're on par. Uh, I, we're under New York, under California. We're, we're higher than Texas, higher than Florida. Uh, I would say kind of middle of the road from a personal tax standpoint. I, I, at one point in my career, I lived in Nevada for three years, so there was no state tax. So every by living in Nevada, immediately it was a five or six percent um, increase in pay to everybody because there was no state tax there. And there are a couple of states that do that. Uh, similarly, I would say we're sort of middle of the road for taxes from a personal standpoint. I think wages, though, we also tend to pay a higher wage than, say, some of the southern states or southwestern states because of cost of living. Um, so I, I think it all evens out. It's look, if, if you're a founder that has a family, I think it's, I've raised both my kids here. It's a great place to raise a family. Um, the school systems are world-class. The university system is world-class. The culture is unbelievable. If you like food, uh, some of the best restaurants in the world are here. Some of the best chefs. I just think it's a really interesting place. And there's a lot of history here. Yeah. Um, Lexington and Concord, the American revolution was started here. There's a lot of history here, so I, I feel very fortunate to call it my home, and um, and, I, and I try not to ever take that for granted. Thank you, thank you. Um, and everyone who is uh, trying to um, uh, figure out uh, about taxation, we have a, a separate video with uh, a U.S. tax advisor. Just go a few videos back, and you'll see how we try to discuss every state. And if you would have some specific question about any state, about Boston, we are happy to. Uh, uh, give you an answer or maybe connect you with our tax advisor in case you need help with that. Um, and um, one final question uh, before I ask the, the other final question. <laughs> um, what, uh, how being in Boston helps you to actually get access to um, US market, get access to VC funding, um, so how, how it's favorable, favorable for if you're in Boston, maybe it's like helping you a lot or maybe just as any other state. Sure. It, it's interesting for me, it's actually been a competitive advantage because the number of people that, that are angels like me that play at the very early stages is not as much as say Silicon Valley. So, um, I actually use it as a competitive advantage. So I get tremendous access in Boston and outside of Boston um, to other ecosystems like Austin, Texas. I do probably two to three calls a week with Austin founders and Austin funds because they're interested to get a different perspective from a Northeast investor. And there aren't that many that play in the early stages up here. So it, I've used it as a competitive advantage. Um, I like the fact that a lot of people and family and friends in Boston don't understand what I do. And they, they actually think, you know, 
I just run around with founders and, and we just have a lot of fun and, and, um, and there's not real work being done. That's, nothing could be further from the truth. It's tremendously hard. Um, so I use it as a competitive advantage, but if you probably realize this, Daniel, you're only as good as your network and a network is only as good if it's worked. So I spend a lion's share of my time doing this, is meeting other people in the ecosystem that could help my founders, figuring out what resources are available to them, and then making sure my founders know of the available resources available so they can grow faster. It's all about making the founders wildly successful. So everything I do, whether it's meeting a new fund, whether it's meeting someone in the ecosystem like yourself that provides content, training, consulting, I always have the lens on of, I'm always looking through the lens of how can this resource help my founders grow faster? How can it help them be more successful? How can it help them get more customers? And if you look through that lens and you're always trying to think of how can you help your founders be successful, I just think good things happen. Yeah, that's fantastic. Well, uh, thank you so much for that. What would be your final uh, um, recommendation and uh, takeaway uh, for the founders considering Boston or trying to uh, compare it with others? Should they go to Boston to, 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 uh, to, to build their business or should they go other states? Um, I, I think that's a decision they're going to have to make. Look, I, I'm biased. I've lived here almost my whole life. I think it's one of the greatest cities in the world. I'd love people to consider Boston. My big ask wouldn't be consider Boston. My big ask of founders would be just get started. Taking that risk and jumping off the cliff to take that first step to starting a company is by far the hardest thing to do. And whether you do it in Boston or anywhere else in the world, I think the fact that they're willing to take that risk, take that leap and start a company, it's a very small percentage of the people in the world that can ever do that and, and have an exit and do it successfully. So they are in very rare company. And I just give them a tremendous amount of credit. It's very humbling to be able to work in the presence of great people that are starting unbelievable companies in Boston and elsewhere. So the key to me is I'd love you to choose Boston, but if you don't, that's okay. But just, just get started, build a massive company. So folks like you and I, Daniel, can go help them. Absolutely. And uh, we are, uh, actually exist exactly for that. So thank you, Steve. Uh, we uh, had an excellent talk. I appreciate your uh, hints, advice and uh, uh, all the recommendations you shared with the founders uh, from around the world. I, rem uh, I would like to remind that Steve is based in uh, Boston and uh, his whole life living in, uh, in there. Um, he's also a, an angel investor and uh, founder of uh, Hands on Angel and uh, he just shared lots of valuable advice uh, for the founders and investors considering Boston startup ecosystem. So uh, before everyone goes, uh, just please don't forget to uh, ask your, your questions here in the comments, like this video, share this video and subscribe to our channel. We try to help founders with sharing this content, with sharing this knowledge so they can use it building their companies and just take their, uh, take their business to the next step. So with our advice uh, and our uh, speaker's recommendations, we hope uh, we can help you achieve more results sooner. So thank you, Steve. Please stay here and I'm stopping the recording. Everyone uh, have a great uh, business and we'll see you soon. Goodbye, everyone.